Hello and welcome to this video on Mendelian genetics, one of the oldest demonstrations of inherited traits. This is the classic model of genetics and has proven a solid foundation for over 150 years. Mendelian genetics are otherwise known as Mendelian inheritance. The name is given after an Austrian monk called Gregor Mendel. He observed a pattern of traits in his peas over the years and was able to link this with the phenotypes he observed. He speculated there was a more complex underlying mechanism at work and began trying to elucidate this in 1865. This process culminated in 1873. Gregor Mendel thought these complex mechanisms were caused by specific parts of the inherited trait that could be interchanged. This went against the existing concept of essences. Essences were thought to be like paint, and so could be blended, where you would get a mixture of the two at the end. We now know that Gregor Mendel's more complex underlying parts are alleles. We have also understood why some of these traits are not a simple case of inheriting a single gene that will then be expressed if it comes from the right parent. Mendel came to his way of thinking by watching grass grow. Well, not quite grass, it was peas. Mendel carried out breeding experiments in his monastery garden, and these were done to test the inheritance patterns of peas under certain circumstances. Particularly, he was looking at selective crossbreeding of common pea plants. By selecting which plants and what phenotypes he could observe over multiple generations and breeding them by hand, he could figure out whether or not something was being passed between them, and whether or not that something was able to be seen in the progeny. It took more than eight years of continuing to not only try and cross-pollinate plants by hand, but ensuring they lived a successful life, that they were the right samples being taken out, being replanted in the ground at the end of the season, and cycling through this. Remember, eight years of continuous work just to demonstrate that he could take pollen from one plant, put it into another plant of the same species, and get a consistent product in what he could observe. In his own words, it took some courage to be able to do this. After all, seeing no results for eight years in what you are doing would drive many people to desperation and despondence. His work was not for nothing, and he came up with three laws at least laws as such, they're more like principles. The first of these is called the Law of Independent Assortment. This says that genes for different traits, or as we now know them phenotypes, will divide independently. That means if you have two different traits from two different parents, you may see them showing up differently in different ways they inherited amongst the children. This is a result of the way various cells mix up their genome. This is called crossing over and occurs during meioses. This allows for a degree of mutation and change as we understand it now, but at the time, all Mendel understood was that genes could be passed from the parents and they could be inherited differently. He had to figure out a way to understand how this different and independent assortment would occur. This led to the Law of Dominance. The Law of Dominance fundamentally says that there is either a dominant or a recessive trait. Think of redheads. The red hair gene is recessive. This means that if you have someone with red hair and someone without red hair breed, they will produce someone without red hair, unless they get both copies of the red hair gene. Getting two copies of a given gene is known as being homozygous. Getting one copy of each gene is known as being heterozygous. In a heterozygous situation, you will nearly always find there is a dominant and recessive trait. It's very rare to get either two recessive or two dominant traits for a variety of reasons. But for now, let's just work on the basis that nearly all genes that Gregor Mendel was looking at were either going to be dominant or recessive. This leads to the obvious problem we've alluded to so far, and that being Gregor Mendel's law of segregation. He had to assume that everybody had two copies of what we call alleles, 
leading to that phenotype. If there weren't two copies, there was no way for the recessive allele to ever show up as the phenotype. It would always be overwhelmed by the dominant allele as there would always be one copy of each at a minimum. This means that everything that was reproducing had to have two alleles. This means four genes interacting at some point to figure out how they would come out as dominant and recessive. This matched with his earlier law of independent assortment. Mendel's approach to this is more than just a strong design in his experiment being an eight year long examination. He had to rely on a sort of math to figure out what was happening. This is demonstrated with Punnett squares. Fundamentally, a Punnett square is good for figuring out how much of a given gene spread will be depicted in one of two traits, where there is a dominant and a recessive gene. This will give you a theoretical spread of that gene over a given number of progeny. A common example is the four square Punnett, where you get a 25 to 100% distribution of the dominant gene, where you have one parent with two recessive and one parent with one recessive and one dominant gene. Each side will give you a value that represents how much of that parent's gene is represented in that child in the way it presents as a phenotype. For example, when we say redheads, imagine a father who has one gene for red hair and one gene that is not for red hair. They would obviously not show up as a red-headed person. Then there is someone with red hair who obviously must have two of the recessive genes. When you put these down in the simplest Punnett square in a 2x2 two two grid, you can see how many of the children would have to have red hair versus how many would normally not have red hair. This means there is a roughly 50% chance that children would come out with that red hair trait and 50% that they would not. In other cases, it's possible that both parents would carry the recessive allele, which is what's happened here. In other cases, one parent may have two copies of the dominant allele, and this means there is 0% chance of the red hair gene coming through as the dominant allele. In other cases, you may find that the multiple and very confounding interaction of many different genes is responsible for the various traits that we see. This is perhaps the big problem with Mendelian genetics. It makes one big assumption to reach the simple but well demonstrated conclusion that the phenotype must only be caused and inherited by a single gene or allele. When you start looking at more complex things like, say, height, eye colour, and so on, they are caused by multifactorial genes, and they are all interacting in a complex way. The Punnett squares, as we've demonstrated them here, can't quite catch all of that in the way they're designed, and there are more complex approaches to take that into account. There are a number of single gene conditions, and a good example of this is something like the BRCA genes. They are a small inherited mutation of a family of genes, but they do lead to a higher risk of breast cancer, despite being a single gene as such. Although there are a variety of genes within that family, each of them can be inherited, and so the risk is associated with just that single mutation and single inherited gene. That's an example of a single gene mutation. Something more complex and is not caught by this would be sex-specific mutations, things like Y chromosome or extra X chromosomes. Things like that can't be caught up by the Mendelian genetic model, and that's simply because the way it's set up doesn't allow for that sort of specific, sex-specific mutation. There are also other conditions that it doesn't work for, other than the multifactorial genes. But in general, if you are looking at an average standard gene that's associated with any of the other 44 chromosomes, this is a good way to try and figure out what's happening. In fact, you can look at some of the historical things occurring around this time to understand why Gregor Mendel thought to do it. There was a lot of issues with inbreeding within royal families, for instance. Often these would cause specific mutations to become entrenched within a family, which would then spread for example, throughout the European royal courts, 
through interbreeding of families. This would then lead to them trying to figure out what was happening and why, and through family trees, you could trace back just where a mutation came from, and to a certain degree, what was responsible for that mutation, simply by figuring out who was demonstrating a particular phenotype in a particular way at a particular time, if it was associated with an inherited mutation. In simple summary, Mendelian inheritance or genetics is a product of observations. It is more than a century ago that we did this, and they have been further verified and built on today. While Gregor Mendel's exact model built of peas is not perfect, his three principles have been well applied and built on. They provide a foundation for us to understand what's going on in many inherited diseases, and if, for example, a family is having problems through multiple generations, that there may in fact be a hereditary aspect to it. This has allowed for things like genetic counselling to be done more efficiently and target particular elements and tests that are better for people to work with and understand, rather than relying on genetic testing. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.